Hello and welcome to Reef Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And today we've been to see Caligula, the ultimate cut. So um, Caligula is a very well-known kind of mad train wreck of a film which had a troubled production in 1979. It came out. Um, it was directed by Tinto Brass. It was written by Gore Vidal. Um, but they sort of didn't really get their say over what the final film would be um, because the producer, Bob Guccione, who founded Penthouse magazine, mm. so you get an idea of the kind of guy he is, um, inserted loads of pornography that he shot himself or, you know, got someone to shoot. And like, and the idea of Caligula is he's an emperor who is renowned for his depravity, madness. I mean, the thing I knew about him, the only thing I knew about him really before seeing the film, even hearing about the film years ago, was that he made his horse into a console. That's like, because I remember reading... Uh, the Rotten Romans, which was a horrible histories book, and, that, and obviously they didn't put the sex in that; it's for kids. Mm. But they put this thing about his horse, which apparently is like not all that true. Um, but that's kind of like it was like representative of his madness. Yes, um, and that's kind of his reputation. And so the film was supposed to be this epic. It was the most expensive independent production ever. I think it still might be. Um, and it was it had these ridiculously opulent sets, costumes, camera work, lighting. Um, and it was going to be full of sex, violence, and so on. And it's kind of famously gone down as this plotless, chaotic mess. Well, huge success, though. Was it? It was. It was one of the top films of 1980. Okay. Yeah, a massive box office hit, because everyone went to see the nudity. Yeah, sure. But this idea has persisted ever since then, that that there's a great film inside the thing that came out waiting to be unleashed. Because you know, cause that's the kind of classic thing of the film that was taken away from the artists. Yeah. You, know, you get that with like Magnificent Ambersons as well. And apparently all of this footage, like 90 hours of footage, has been unearthed. I don't know exactly the, the kind of situation. We get that in titles at the beginning of the film, which I found quite interesting because it said, you know, this is based on 90 hours of footage... Uh, none of which is in the original released version. This is all previously unseen footage that you're about to see. Which is interesting, and I and I doubted that, to be honest. I thought, How can, can that really be true? But I was just reading the... Um, well, he's not he's not credited as director here. I don't know exactly what his credit is, but the, the guy who's overseen this... Well, it's not a restoration, it's a rebuilding of the film. Yeah. Um, kind of from first principles. The idea is to to kind of hew as close to Gore Vidal's script as they possibly can. Mm. Um, his name is uh, Thomas Negovan. Um, he's a writer, musician, and art historian from Chicago. That's Wikipedia. Mm. Um, I've never heard of the guy, and no. he's not put down as a film director. Mm. Um, and Tinto Brass's name is no longer credited as film director. He's credited as principal photography now. And he has um, disavowed, sort of, you know, distanced himself from this as well version as, as well as the, the original right one. i don't know t i guess he was didn't want to speak to them or whatever it might be because from what i understand this thomas negavan um has you know taken in as much material as he can from the time interviews with the actors and director and so forth to say you know to see what mm. what were the intentions and so on and spoken to people who were involved in the production just just immersed himself in scanning and watching all of this footage mm. and apparently so he says he didn't see the original film until he was some way into editing the film, this this new version. Mm. So I can believe now that no original theatrical footage has made it into this, just because it appears to be not what he was picking from. He wasn't saying, I'll go from this particular scene and recut it like this. He seems to have been picking from raw footage from scratch to yeah. build a film as he says. Well, it. I'm a bit disappointed because I would have liked I would have liked to have so if part of the original problem was that Bob Guccione filmed this hardcore footage and interspersed it in the film at the expense of the film, cutting out narrative, I would have liked to have seen the film restored with, you know, what was originally in it, yeah, and what was originally taken out for the hardcore footage. Whereas this idea that, you know, it's completely unseen footage, I, even if they're having the same scene or the same bit of dialogue, they're using a different take or something. That's what it seems to be, yeah. Yeah, I kind of, I don't like the idea of it, you know, though I found the whole thing kind of 
very entertaining with, I mean, the things that you mentioned earlier as kind of criticism, I loved. I loved uh, the costumes. I loved the set design, right? Like kind of... Well, the, those were meant as criticisms. Uh, I mean, that's just a description of the scale of this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I love that. Uh, they looked amazing. I mean, the, they looked ridiculous. Yeah. And and the, the, um, the camera work is heavily planometric, right. straight on shots, which with sets like this really emphasise the scale yeah. and make those buildings intimidating. That's right. So I really appreciated all of that. I thought it had some fabulous imagery as well. Yeah. You know, kind of John Gilgood kind of cutting his veins in the bath and you see like these two almost like velvety strands, you know, kind of from his wrists, right? Like, yeah, kind of, uh, I thought that was, that was wonderful. Um, so, you know, I, I wasn't bored. It wasn't the experience that I expected because I wanted to have some kind of reference to the original. and this Which we've be, never seen. Yeah, which we've never yeah, seen, but, so you know, so still to see because this is an entirely new thing. I mean, it really feels like it, I'm from the sound of what everyone has said, a completely different film. Yeah. So I mean, this has a plot. It has character arcs. No one has ever said that about the original Caligula. Well, yeah, character arcs. <laughs> Up to a point, but I mean, Helen Mirren, for instance, in the original, apparently was in it for nine minutes. In here, she's in for some fifty-three minutes. All right. So well, she, the, the, but you know, well, I was going to say she doesn't get much to do. But though, I mean, obviously she does yeah. in terms of plot, but she doesn't in terms of character. You know. Uh, so I think it's trash really, the whole film. So, again, the comparison to Ambersons, to me, it's like, you know, Ambersons is a truly great film and you can see why people mourn, you know, the, yeah. the ending and so on. Kind of, you know, this is trash, but nonetheless, very entertaining and also kind of illuminating on some things, right? Like, it kind of made me really appreciate Malcolm McDowell. Well, Malcolm McDowell has said... Finally, a version of this film where you can see my one of my best performances. He's very happy with this. It's uh, great with this recut, and you can see why. Yeah, you can see why it's all about him, and he is wonderful in it. Yeah. And he looks. Fa- I mean, he looks beautiful. Well, actually, I thought it was interesting because in some shots, the way that he's filmed, he really looks beautiful. Mm. In other shots, he looks like you know a working class Joe from Newcastle or something. Yeah, you know yeah. that kind of you know that light kind of slightly reddish haired look that they have you know <laughs> uh, so so that combination of sometimes extraordinary beauty sometimes ordinariness but coupled with a truly brave performance and I mean brave in every sense brave in that he's naked full frontal mm-hmm. right like uh, you know I mean not throughout but you know there are occasions but also in his choices right like kind of you know that moment where he comes sliding into the Senate, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, the choosing like risky to slide. Business. Yeah, like risky business. <laughs> uh, before risky business, and he's funny and he's camp and he does drag and yeah, yeah. He, fisting. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of incredible, incredibly daring uh, in all kinds of ways, and he plays it with great humor, I think, as well. Yeah? yeah, you know, so so he is absolutely tremendous and the reason to see the film. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount of absurdity to everything that's being shown. There's like, it, there's, you can feel a, a satirical intent mm. behind it, right? And it reminded me rather of Salo, which was also about you know sexual depravity um, amongst kind of elites, yes. you know? and that had, I think, a much more pointed political purpose. Very much so. Um, and it was much more cohesive and yeah, absolutely everything. But I think you you feel some of the same things here, and these films are not so far apart in terms of oh, this is what 1979. Uh, Sala was 1975. Yeah. Um, and, you know, these are not the only films to have, to have satirised power and to have connected it with sex. Um, but there is something about the the large scale of them both, the orgy scenes, essentially, yes. it, that that seem... That there seems to be something of the time in that. But for me, they're very different, because in Salo, my God, you know, like, actually, you know, when I first saw Salo, I had to get out halfway through and vomit. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was very young, uh, and I'd never seen anything like it before. And that circle of shit stuff, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like was I that mean, not X-rated? Sorry, was that not X-rated, Salo? Because you said that you couldn't see Caligula because it was X-rated. I couldn't see Caligula, but but I saw Salo. I mean, I couldn't go. I didn't see Caligula at all. Mm. I saw Salo, and it must have been after I turned eighteen in a repertory cinema because. 
you know, it might have been made and released in 75, 76, but, but then it circulated in repertory cinemas for a decade after. That. Okay. So, uh, but, but I was still very young when I saw it, so I must have just turned 18 or something. Sure. You know, I'd never seen anything like that before, and, you know, and I literally went out to vomit. I mean, mm. you know, so, so, I mean, this is, this is orgies for fun and pleasure and delight and yes, clearly you know, to be in, turned on there's by, an intent to right, titillate right. and yeah. everything's kind of for shock value and you can only imagine I mean maybe we'll, we will get around to seeing the original cut at some point you can only imagine how much more for shock value that would have been Yeah. Um, because here it does feel uh, I suppose you know you were saying oh it wasn't quite the experience I expected and I feel the same way but it's because I didn't know anything and so when I I, and I just know the reputation of Caligula and then when you see Caligula, the ultimate cut, what does that suggest? More of everything. Mm. Like, but this is the only director's cut or you know, kind of restoration type cut of a film to put less of that stuff in. Yeah. You know, because it's like, no, no, no. The, th the stuff that we think is, could be good or is good and is just hidden is all of this story that is incoherent from the original or not fully explained, all that kind of stuff, which is what they've tried to do here. And it and it, it is coherent and it does make sense. And I do think there are character arcs and I think it privileges the, the performances um, of the actors. But I also found it very slow. Three hours feels like a long time, which is what this is. Uh, I actually, I, I loved it almost all the way through until I began to wonder, when is this intermission happening, right? Like, you know... I didn't even know uh, that would be one. Yeah, um, I did because I think it said so at the beginning uh, in the credit sequence or maybe in the program it said there would be an intermission. It said somewhere. Yeah, you bought the ticket, so probably yeah, on the but, website. Yeah, it did say that. Uh, so maybe it was that. Um, but I did kind of begin to look at, at my watch uh, towards the end of the first uh, section. The, se the, the last section after the intermission was so short yeah it was under yeah. an hour that you know that um that seemed to go by kind of quickly I, I i can't say i was bored though i do you know so i suppose my question to you is what are these character arcs what is the film about really yeah what is the point of it because you know i mean i had fun watching it right um it's, and it's very humorous and very sly and kind of playful mm. right so I did enjoy it but actually if you're talking about it in terms of like a film you know as a work of art with depth and so on I mean I don't see no, it I mean I, th I think that's extremely limited and I won't defend it on the, on the counter I think this is one of the best films I've ever seen but I think they they seem to have dug out something that was you know apparently not there in the original I think but you know essentially the story of Caligula as told in this film is that um he uh, his what his great his great uncle I think Tiberius mm. is on his last legs, um, played by uh, Peter O'Toole. He's got VD. He's got sores mm. all over his face. He thinks everyone's out to get him. He's gone mad. Mm. Um, he's on his last legs. They kill him to make sure of it. Mm. Um, and he becomes the emperor at the age of I think he's twenty four. Um, he has an enormous amount of fun straight away. He he gets in with the people straight away. You know you, this general amnesty he immediately brings in because all the again it's very generally explained, isn't it? But um, all these people that uh, Tiberius had um, exiled, he says bring them back. You know forget all that. It's a fresh start. And by the end of his four years, and by the time he's murdered mm. by a conspiracy of his sort of vizier and um, and the uh, leader of the armed forces. Um, he has turned into Tiberius. He's saying the same things. Mm. You know, he's driven mad by power. And so I, I'm, it's in, I wonder, certainly by the very end, I think you, you, you have to go with the, the impression that he has really lost his mind. And this stuff that he's been saying before then about being a god, literally being a god, um, and the thing about, you know, turning his horse into a constable, which appears in this film, mm. I think are played... Um, quite rightly, as sort of jokes. I mean, certainly the thing about being a god is because he he gets the Senate, he he you know, intimidates the Senate into voting that he is a god. He goes, he says, I, 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 and, and they have to go along with it. And then he says to to his wife, the Helen Mirren character, "Do you think I'm a god?" And she goes, "Yes." And you know that she doesn't. And he goes, "Are you just as stupid as them?" Like he's like a deliberate. You know, he doesn't believe he's a god at that point. By the end, he might do. You know, and the thing about the horse, I think it plays as 
an offhand comment or joke on on the Senate, you know, like a horse could do your job sort of thing, or, or I take you so unseriously, I will put a horse in there too. As think, opposed to, I really believe my horse is the right guy for the job. I, I think it's a very poor piece of writing by Gore Vidal. Uh, I don't think it tells us anything about the Roman Empire. I, I really don't think it tells us uh, anything about Caligula. I mean, he begins mad, right? Like, he's, he is already somebody at the beginning of the film who's sleeping with his sister yeah. and who has killed every member of his family except for the emperor. Yeah. He's right? just scheming. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so kind of, you know, once he gets once he gets on the throne and has absolute power, he just does more of that until the end where he gets killed for doing more of that. Hmm. I don't get any sense of progression. Actually, I think uh, uh, Matthew Mac uh, uh, McDowell is so great because he makes you kind of find that character appealing and funny and I mean he's never quite endearing you certainly kind of don't have empathy for what he does mm. but you get a joy out of the performance of you know all those evil things mm. but I don't see size to that or depth to the characters as, as no. written right mm. um, so so you know so when you talk about arc that's like change and development and so on I, I don't see that okay fair yeah. enough um, yeah, yeah, but at uh, least a plot. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> lots. There's lots of plot. Yeah, that's you know, arguably yeah. too much. I mean, there's uh, there are, there's probably one too much. I would like because I'm just thinking, where is all the sex? You know, I was promised so much sex, and of course, I wasn't promised all this sex. This is not that cut. Um, but you know, but there's like, quite a lot of sex. There's, there's quite a lot of sex and tits and stuff, and it's lovely. Um, but like, they've taken out definitely. I don't know how long the original cut is. To be fair, I, d I doubt it's three hours long. Um, but certainly. That they've been like replacing, you know, pornography with, you know, an argument between Malcolm McDowell and Helen Mirren, which I guess is like kind of dramatically more interesting. But I do kind of think, is if the point of this was to exhibit debauchery and titillate and so on, I'm missing that here. Oh, I'm not. I mean, so I think what's missing is uh, close-ups of <laughs> hardcore penetration. Right. But everything that. else is there. I mean, you know, my God, you even have like, you know, a birth scene with like the head of the baby. It's true. There's still of, some shocking stuff. You know, uh, Helen Mirren's vagina and you see it all. Right. Like and, you a know, rape on a wedding night. And yeah. And yeah. The rape of a wedding night of the groom and the bride. Uh, you know, it's I mean, I think it's got everything flogging dildos. I mean, actually, one of the things that made me think of because. You know, John Gilgood and uh, Peter O'Toole kept saying, oh, we didn't know what we were getting into. And you think, are you fucking kidding me? Because you see them <laughs> now and there's a big dildo in front of their face and they're fondling some lady's breast. Right? And they say, oh, we didn't know it would be that kind of film. I mean, yeah. you know, when you consider that this is like uh, uh, filmed in 1978, 79, mm. I mean, you know, the idea of doing that 15 years before would have been unimaginable in another universe, really, right? Like, yeah. you know... So they might not have realized that it would be like hardcore close-up penetrative sex, but they actually knew. And, you know, in a film of that period where you have the leading man and the leading lady, the above the title leading man, full frontal nude, mm. you know, in a mainstream film of 1979, when have you seen that before or since? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't remember. I mean... You know, Tom Cruise doesn't show his dick. John Travolta doesn't show his dick. Like, Brad Pitt's never shown his dick. <laughs> I mean, you ben know, Affleck so... and Gone Girl. Blink and you miss it, but it was there. Okay, but fair no, I, I, I know what you mean. I, yeah. I completely get what you mean. Um, I, I've definitely been ruined by, you know, modern pornography and access to sexual imagery because it's just not the same. You know, like, like you, 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 the stuff that is on show in this film, although it is, you know, uh, <laughs> done to a kind of aestheticised... Um, degree and very mm. expensive degree and it looks marvellous but it's all stuff that you can just see for free online like and have been yeah. able to for 20 years it's it's sort of sexual imagery it's very differently available now and it's very differently understood and just kind of integrated into people's psyches see, than I, it was 1979 actually I, w I would argue so let me kind of just be contrary as usual because <laughs> you see I I would argue that the nudity and the sex is still one of the reasons to go see this film. Yeah. Because, you know, 
the bodies are so different, mm. you know, than what you see in porn, right? Uh, or what you see today, even. Mm. Like, you know, there's nobody body built, right? There's nobody who's got a nautilized body, mm -hmm. right? Kind of, you know, so they've got very beautiful bodies. But actually, one of the interesting things in this film is seeing the bodies and how different they all are, right? Like, mm. you know, uh, I mean, and even seeing Helen Mirren, you know, who I think is, you know, it's very beautiful. She's got a wonderful body. And again, she's completely naked, right? But also she's got like, I don't know, like a Russian peasant's body, right? Her her <laughs> hips are very large, right? Mm -hmm. And she's got kind of short legs and very full breasted and yeah, like kind of, you know, so, so a very beautiful body, but it's not the kind of body that you see kind of, you know, yeah. You're not watching the right porn, Jose. Well, maybe. There's all sorts available. May, maybe, <laughs> but. I know what you mean. You know. These are, these are, these are bodies and like looks of their time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Of, of, of a time which allowed for more diversity, mm. I think, you know, because certainly like, um, you know, if I mean, to me, a lot of the female film stars of today, for example, they're all kind of like relatively tall and quite thin and full breasted and small hipped. Yeah, kind of, you know, I mean, Angelina Jolie is a type of ideal of that. Right. But you don't you don't see any wide hipped film stars. Mm. Right. Like, you know, uh, so so I thought just kind of looking at Helen Mirren naked was kind of, you know, mm. interesting. The attitude to sex also, which is very playful. Right. So you do have a lot of dildos and swings. And, you know, so there's a thing of it's kind of romanticized in a way. Yeah. Made decadent in another. But it's also like a kind of a wink or a joke. It's a cartoon. Or, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So so and that attitude to sex you know, that it isn't serious, that it isn't, yeah, mm. that it's kind of fun and body and, you know, like, you know, the joke with the coins and the vagina and like to make a magic trick out of it. I think of. I missed that one. Well, you know, <laughs> in the, in the, when, when, when Colin McDowell goes into the jail yeah. and there's an orgy happening and, I'm, you know, the jailer comes in and he turns out to be a magician and he takes one coin, makes it disappear. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah yes. Uh, so... You know, kind of, I mean, that's all very playful, I think, mm. you know. Yeah. I mean, it has an element of threat, but it's still also kind of, you know, very playful. Yeah. Uh, well, sex is absolutely used for threat as well, in, you know, when it comes to particularly that, that wedding sure. scene, the Prima Noctis scene, yeah. which, is, which is really dark. I would be interested to see how that's handled in the original film in particular. Because, yes. I mean, you, you, again, from, the, from the, the sound with the original film, it's this kind of chaotic mess. Um, but that is a particularly dark scene. You have to handle that. I, I, it's interesting how it's handled. Actually, at one point, it made me laugh um, because he he's um, he's saying he's basically threatening them into it. Like they don't really believe, and then they, it suddenly becomes clear that he is going to do this. Um, and he's sort of questioning: Is she is she really a virgin? You know, she's a virgin. And then he has sex with her, and there's blood everywhere, and and it's awful, and the imagery is horrendous. Mm. But then he just kind of jumps off with a kind of Oh, well, she really was a virgin. Mm. And that line, that live delivery, really made me laugh. I was the only one who did, and yes. I felt like other people were judging me. <laughs> yes, I, I did as well. <laughs> you judged uh, me or you laughed? No, I laughed. Okay, I laughed, good yeah. Um, yes. I mean, that's, that is a, a really... Um, that is a delicate play with tone going on. Yes, there, you know, it is. Which works. Um, yes. But again, you see... So again, just to go back and looking at it as a normal narrative film, you think, what motivated him to do it right so you know he, he went to try out wives this one was a virgin who was promised to someone else you know um mm. was that the motivation for well in the previous scene he tried to kill the husband yeah by putting him into that wall of death thing but he survived it and so this seems to be the the improvised improvised way of i know of a revenge i know i get mm. that yeah. but a revenge for what did he even want her i mean i don't remember him saying i want her no Right. So, so mind you, that's in keeping with the character, right? That, you know, capriciousness. He is, yeah, the capriciousness. But then kind of it means that everything lacks a certain kind of cohesion. Mm. Right. So I must say I had a very good time nonetheless. Right. Like, yeah, so did you know, I. And I really I loved uh, the look. And if this is a restoration of the footage, at least, they did a very good job because you know, the 35 has a kind of a graininess. Yeah, you can tell mm. that it is like a 35, but it's beautiful and the colors are beautiful. 
you know, and I really, I really appreciated uh, Peter O'Toole's look mm. with all the red patches for his syphilis and mm. so on. I, you think, my God, he really let himself, you know, kind of be shown in this way. On the other hand, I really didn't like his performance, right? And I thought it was interesting because obviously what they wanted to do was bring in a lot of prestige British actors. Because, mm. I mean, the only person who was any kind of box office at that moment was Malcolm McDowell, mm. right? You know, uh, because of his work with Kubrick and Lindsay Anderson and, mm. yeah. Uh, though not big box office, but, you know, mm. kind of, I mean, he is above the title. Kind of everything else is is really just was it posh English stage actors, right? Like classy, yeah, sorry, classy. But it's trying posh. to it's trying to bring that particular type of actor in, yes. to add a certain something to what you're saying. You it's going to shock you with how debauched it then is. Yes, and you see, I thought Colin McDowell was marvelously <laughs> witty. McDowell. Sorry, Ma Malcolm <laughs> McDowell was marvelously witty. Uh, with his line readings and his inflections, and he made you mm. yeah, laugh and pay attention in unexpected ways. I thought Peter O'Toole was terrible, mm. right? It was like, you know, that kind of cliche of a British stage actor just declaiming things in a loud voice, right? His, yeah. his performance throughout the beginning seemed completely one note in that register. Yeah. And it was only his look, yeah, that kind of makes that performance interesting, I think. Yeah, you know. the very bad one note kind of King Lear thing. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, I just found his dialogue and a lot of the dialogue in the early part of the film just very hard to understand. Whether it's the shoutiness, the, something about the recording, I don't know what it was, but it, maybe it's the sound system, I don't know. It just wasn't, I, I, I wasn't getting a lot of it. And then when he goes and kind of normal conversations start happening at normal levels, I was like, okay, I can understand these yeah, words now. It's... That was an issue. Yeah, um, uh, it's him being kind of loud and actory and stagey, yeah. which, you know, and I say it as someone who really loves Peter O'Toole, mm. but this was a terrible performance, I thought, but but with a fascinating look. Uh, and then John Gilgut, I thought, was brilliant, you know, just, you know, he looked amazing. He was given fantastic imagery. He was kind of the opposite of O'Toole, yeah, because he was very subdued. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it was a real kind of pleasure uh, to see him. So, you know, on a performance level, I liked it on the whole kind of uh, uh, very much. I really, really love the look of it, even though you are right. It's not. And I, I don't like using this term because cinematic can be anything, but actually because it can be anything, when you often see that static head on kind of type of shooting, you see, it does bring out the scale of the film. Mm. Yeah. But kind of when it's overused, it feels it's unimaginative. But yeah. So what, what is interesting about the film visually comes from the set design and the lighting sure, and the yeah. costumes, not from anything that's being done with the camera. No, I, I guess I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I do. I did like the, the planimetric shooting. And I thought, I like, it, was, I, I thought it, it was consistently too. effective, but there's also not a lot of variety in it. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Uh, so so, and I'm very glad I saw it. And actually, it makes me want to watch. Yeah, like, we should look at the original. Yeah, to what extent? I mean, I don't know how many versions and cuts there are, but to what extent we can find, you know, the original. Well, original. there'll be the original release yeah, at I least. Guess. Yeah. I mean, I just don't know. I just don't know. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I, well, but, uh, but yeah, I, it's not lost, is it? It's like no. I mean, the idea is that all this footage, I guess, was kind of. I don't think it was lost. It was just like archived. I mean, from what I get, from what I got from this, um, this Thomas Negavan, who's who's put this together, it seems like he was just given access to these archives and then it kind of came up in conversation, so are you going to do this? And then he felt like if he didn't, the archives would be closed for half a century and no one else would get to. Sure. So that's the kind of impression I get. Like, it wasn't so much his intention right away, but but it became imperative almost. Like, yeah. if, if someone has to do this, it has to be me then. Oh, um, well, I'm very glad I saw it. I mean, you know, kind of... And actually, let me tell you, had I seen this when I was 18... You know, kind of Malcolm McDowell would have become one of my sex pinup gods. Still time. Still time. You're still around. Uh, the, the one other thing I want to say is um, how brilliantly comfortable the Mockingbird seats are. We saw this on the Mockingbird in screen two, and the last film we saw there was, I think, the the public lavatory film set in Japan. Vin yeah, Vendors. the Vin Vendors film. Um, yeah. What was it called? Um, P Perfect Days. Yes. Which was a lovely film, but I remember the seats being uncomfortable and. 
I think since then it seems unless I'm just misremembering, it seems like they've they've filled out that cinema with these wonderful deep cushioned sort of armchairs. Which I, I love. I, I love the whole place, and uh, you know, I would go a lot more if it was closer to me. But I love the ambiance. I love the staff. Everyone is super nice. I mean, you know, I had bought the tickets for both of us, and you were twenty minutes late. And I just told the usher, yeah, kind of, my mm. friend is going to come in late. Could you let him in? He said, no problem. I mean, yeah, he was sound. I can't imagine Cineworld, you know, doing the same. And actually, there were times when I've tried to do that at, uh, at, the, at the former electric, and they wouldn't do it either. Mm. Right. So I think it has a really nice atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, good guys. Yeah. In so. fact, I think I might be misremembering the seats thing. I think maybe last time. There were a lot of comfortable seats, but we were sat right at the front on cheap seats that have been like added in extra. So ah. I think maybe that's why I'm remembering. So so if you can get in just the regular seats, you're doing well. That's and also lovely seats. And if I can say, they have really inventive programming, right? Which the electric did not. Yeah, the electric it was kind of, you know, uh, mainly uh, the same type of films that you get at Cineworld, with you know, a really high profile international release or something. Whereas this, it's kind of, you know, I don't know how they do it. And they must have guest programmers and they have a lot of people that come in to show stuff they like, mm -hmm. right? You know, but they're showing a lot of indie films. They were showing some like at heart. Yeah, they're showing a lot of festival films. Yeah, so it's a place if you live in Birmingham to go see things that are otherwise quite difficult to see. Mm. Yeah, they're being kind of very inventive with with the programming. So, so congratulations to them, really. Yeah, and uh, just last thing, but, uh, talking about well, two things, brief. Actually, three things briefly. Okay. One, <laughs> one, but one is just the look because you were talking about the look, and I, I, and remember we were talking about just Deadpool just the other day, mm. and you were saying you love the glossiness. Yes. And I was thinking, I, I agreed with you. I did like the look of it, but I and I didn't say this at the time, but I was thinking I don't know that glossy is a word I would have used for that film. Glossy is a word I would use for this. Well, you see, I wouldn't. Okay. Yeah, because the way that I'm using glossy is in that kind of MGM metro color way where the reds and the yellows gleam. They almost seem like porcelain or metallic, mm. right? Yeah, and it has a density and a texture and, you know. Um, I felt that here. I felt that in the costumes, in the, in the, um, the death of the sister scene where it gets rich and dark red the lighting is just pure red and you know i, I felt it really popped and i i thought the the image was a bit grainier i mean it's very beautiful don't get me wrong yeah, yeah. right but kind of you know we're just kind of talking about the use of 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 that term you know it's very beautiful use of color and so on you know there's that bit with uh, malcolm mcdowell with the red cape you know mm. kind of like really stands out and also the blues that are really pastelly and so on so I think there's beautiful use of color, beautiful use of costumes, but to me it doesn't have that textured sheen and shine, yeah, that I associate with glossiness. I I think this is kind of, you know, a better use of of color, mm. yeah, and a more subtle use of color. A lot of the colors are subtle, like you know when you see uh, Malcolm McDowell come in at the beginning, you know, and he's wearing that white tunic with bits of light green yeah, mm -hmm. on it and so on. I mean, you know, that is not like, uh, you know, the colors of, of, you know, what Francois Truffaut said about Technicolor, you know, that they're the colors of the 20th century because nothing like it can be found in nature. Well, you know, that's mm -hmm. not true of this film, I don't think. <laughs> um, I just want to briefly mention two of the actors. One is Teresa Ann Savoy, who played Drusilla. Mm -hmm. um, Caligula's sister. Mm. I mean, talk about a brave performance with Malcolm McDowell. She gives one as well. Yeah. She's asked to do an awful lot. And here you go. Yeah, but I think she's more standard. Yeah, sure. You know, and generic, actually. Uh, uh, she, she seems to me to be pretty kind of European 1970s kind of, you know, pretty girl who does nudes. I, I, don't, I don't actually... I thought Sorry. she didn't. You, know, you you see her with McDowell, who's being so, you know, brave and inventive, and you know she doesn't. Sure. Yeah. Um, but no, I liked her very much, nonetheless. I just wanted okay. to mention that. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and the other person I want to mention, and this is just pure looks, is um, Guido Minari, who plays uh, Macro, 
who's the the first um a sort of army leader. I don't know actually what the job is, but you know, yeah, yeah. army leader that we meet who who yeah, is, yeah. Um, who kills Tiberius and then is yeah, um, arrested yeah. and killed Tiberius himself. Because th- there are so many shots of him just kind of artfully framed with him just on the on the left or on the right and just looking yes. and sort of stood up straight and doing his job and just observing all that. Where he is, like, you, you can you can picture the marble bust of him. Sure, he looks unbelievable. Just yeah. his face and his his attitude. Yeah, I love the way he looks. He looks incredible for this. I think that of some some of the other actors. I also think that of Malcolm McDowell. He, you can picture the bust of him too. Well, you, he has the right look. The film pictures it for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. But um, but he he has this unbelievable look. Yeah, like they picked him out of Rome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he looks very very handsome. Um, that's it for me. All right. Well, we enjoyed it, and I would recommend it. And actually, it really is a film, a big budget release. Yeah. Like you've never seen before, yeah, with huge or, or since actually, you know, again, kind of. I was just thinking that as well. Like, I was yeah. thinking, what do you compare this to? Intolerance, maybe Griffith, and like Triumph of the Will in terms of like the budget and the scale and just showing off the goods. I mean, budget and scale, I've seen the likes before and since, you know, but uh, kind of the casual nudity, you know, the stars' nakedness. You know, in combination with the with the budget mm. and the sta- you know the scale, and yeah. I've never seen that before. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, so I think it's kind of, you know, interesting for what the film tells us about the mores and social conventions of the period, and you know, kind of what what titillated at that moment, and what could be made a joke of in that moment as well. Yeah, the film is, I think, a kind of quite humorous. And, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I'd highly recommend it, even though it's not a great film. No, no. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on uh, Apple Podcasts, Audible, uh, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, and YouTube Music. We're on social media: Facebook and Twitter at Eavesdrop Movies, and Blue Sky Eavesdropping Sky Social, and the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. <laughs>